call the remote hearing of the Joint House and Senate Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee to order. Today is Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. My name is Rick Hansen. I'm a state representative and I have the privilege of chairing the House Environment and Natural Resources Finance Division. Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen is the chair of the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee. Um, and we, this is a joint hearing. Uh, Bill, would you like to say a few words for starting before I go through some of the uh, things that we need to do just for procedure? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending here. Uh, I don't think the meeting will be too long. I don't, I don't expect it to be very long. Uh, this is, a, uh, I certainly apologize for not being at the uh, first meeting, but I'm very interested in, in the progress that we're, uh, we're uh, moving forward with with our, our uh, very important uh, issue with regards to our whitetail population here in Minnesota. Uh, so I think what we'll do is, uh, again, I'm the chair of the uh, Senate Finance uh, Committee, Environmental Finance Committee, and uh, Representative Hansen and I are, are doing our due diligence by having uh, uh, two meetings a year, and this is one of them, so welcome. Thank you, Bill. Uh, members, just for a few reminders on guidelines, all uh, committee discussion will continue to go through the chair. If you want to, to be recognized, please use the raise your hand button. For members on the phone, please use star nine, and that should activate the raise your hand symbol. If you are not getting called on, please send an email to committee administrator, Peter Strohmeyer and Dallas Fisher. We will hold members questions until after the presentation. Just to, to clarify on that. So we're gonna have a number of slide presentations and it's very difficult to hop back and forth between questions and the slides. So what we're going to do is have the presenters uh, go through their side, slide presentations and hold questions until after the presentations. And please use your, uh, your blue hand uh, so that we can follow up. Please mute yourselves so we can reduce any background noise. Please try to limit the noise in your workspace when you are speaking. Members are expected to unmute themselves when called on by the chair. The CA and the CLA may mute members if their mute is left off and there's background choice, background noise, excuse me. This is an informational hearing and no official business will be conducted. The CLA will note the roll call roll for attendance. With that, the first presenter is Dr. Peter Larson. Uh, Dr. Larson, please state your name and, and who you're with and begin your presentation. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Chairs Hansen and Inger Britson and members of both House and Senate committees, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Peter Larson. I'm assistant professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. I'm also co-director of the Minnesota Center for Prion Research and Outreach, or MinPro. I'm joined here today with Dr. Tiffany Wolf, MinPro co-director, and Mark Schwabenlander, MinPro program manager. And I'll go ahead and share my screen here. It's up and running. Okay, how does that look for everybody? Good? Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to give a, a highlight um, some of the research and outreach opportunity or research and outreach that we've been able to conduct in the last um, uh, past six months or so. I'll go ahead and try to advance this. Okay, and this is a, a, a picture of our new, some pictures of our new uh, prion research laboratory at the University of Minnesota in the College of Veterinary Medicine. We had hoped to offer some an on-site tour sometime uh, um, before the pandemic hit. Obviously, that slowed everything down, but there's some images of, of the newly formed uh, research lab. So again, to remind everyone, our goal is to develop advanced uh, CWD diagnostic tools that are faster, more sensitive, easier to use, um, uh, and to develop functional prototypes that could be used within uh, two years. And that puts us at a fall 2021 timeframe. And also those prototypes for new CDB diagnostics could be used with hunter harvested deer, live deer, and environmental samples. So in January, 2020, the MinPro Molecular Lab became fully operational. 
In March 2020, all non-essential uh, University of Minnesota labs shut down due to COVID-19, and there was a one-year hiring freeze implemented. Um, in June and July, uh, late June, early July 2020, the Mineral, MinPro lab uh, reopened at 50% capacity, so we were shut down um, from March to, to uh, late June, early July. Um, but now we're currently running at 50% capacity following University of Minnesota COVID-19 safety measures. We have limited staff within the, within the laboratory to help reduce the potential for transmission within the lab. But the good news is, is that we've established three independent lines of research that have um, generated some really exciting preliminary data just in the past few months. The good news is even though we're operating at 50% capacity, we hired some excellent staff um, and we have students working for us that are just absolutely ama amazing. We've been able to adapt as best we can to this new COVID-19 reality. The first line of research, and I, again, I, I, I'll highlight some of these. I'm gonna dig deeper into one in particular, but I can't go into too many details because we are working through, we have IP and there will be patents initially. So if I provide too many details, that could result in a public disclosure. So I'm trying to navigate that as best I can through the Office of Technology and Commercialization at the University of Minnesota. The first research avenue that's really exciting is antibody engineering. We're generating new small antibodies that have great binding solutions to prion proteins. So that's really exciting, it opens up. We've heard a lot of antibodies recently due to COVID-19 where of a similar research line where we're identifying antibodies that can bind to CWD prions. Light-based nanotechnologies. So we can actually, uh, there's plenty of, of, of research out there published on this area where we can detect unique light scattering across prion positive, uh, pathogenic misformed prion positive material versus negative. And we're adapting some of that for CWD and some very exciting um, results with that. But one in particular is this RT quick. And I highlighted this during the, the last session, um, sessions earlier uh, uh, this year in February. These are protein amplification methods. RT quick is a new, relatively new tool that the CWD diagnostic community is really excited about. And then microfluidic RT-Quick is taking that method and making it smaller, cheaper, easier to use. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this method because we're really excited. We have this fully operational now in the MinPro wet lab and we're expanding on it. And this is a great asset for the state of Minnesota uh, that is just coming online here. And real quickly, the way that this works is um, a CWD prion. So I'm showing you an image of a CWD prion in the upper right hand there. You can see it's, it's misformed. It's got all these, uh, uh, it's like stacks of, of um, um, uh, proteins next to each other. If you take that uh, CWD prion and you, you take a sample, you put it in a tube, let's say you put that in a test tube with normal prions and I'm showing you what normal prions look like there. If you take that in and you mix it with normal prions but then you incubate and shake it over time, it will cause those normal prions to misfold into the abnormal shape. This is like a daisy chain reaction, okay? And the way RT quick is, it leverages that reaction, but it, it recreates that reaction in a, a plate, in a, in a 96, in a tube, if you will, in a tube. And it can measure the misfolding using a fluorescent dye. So there's a fluorescent dye that we add to the reaction that binds to the misfolded form. And if there's a CWD positive, sample that causes that daisy chain reaction, we can measure it in real time using a fluorescent dye, okay? And this is just a, a, a way to visualize that um, in, uh, so it can detect using, using tissues, like let's say a lymph node or muscle, it can detect CWD positive material in about nine hours. And in that picture on the left there, I'm showing you the microplate reader that we use as a piece of equipment that we use and can uh, uh, perform multiple, multiple reactions all at once. So it can detect uh, uh, CWD positive, um, uh, let's say lymph nodes in about nine hours. Uh, environmental samples, it takes a little longer. In this graph, this is a readout. This is what we see uh, when the reaction's happening. And I know it's kind of complicated there, but all the different colors, those curves there, those are serial dilutions of a CWD positive lymph node. And you can see in that blue, that first blue curve, how it goes up rapidly. Well, that's that reaction happening. That's the dye binding to those misfolded prions. And as they, as they misfold, as they, as they, that chain reaction happens, the intensity and fluorescence on that y-axis goes up and up and up. And we can measure that um, and compare it against control samples. And that's how RT-Quick works. 
So the reason why this is so exciting is that this is useful for both live and harvested deer. So they can be used for blood. We have a, a, um, a protocol now that's active in the lab where we can do RT cook from blood samples. We have protocols for fecal samples, tissue biopsies, muscle. We've done hundreds of reactions now on lymph nodes. It can be used for brain. So the, the, the sample diversity is really exciting there. It's also useful for environmental detection of prions. It's so sensitive that you can look at the presence of misfolded prions in soil, plants, and water. We have started uh, uh, plant experiments to get at that environmental component of our diagnostic tool. We've started plant exper uh, experiments where we are inoculating plants barley, oats, alfalfa, replicating some of the previous publications showing CWD prions can be uptaken by plants through the root system. So we're doing this now in the MinPro wet lab and we'll be able to use RT Quick to look for presence or absence in prions in different plant tissues. Okay, I can't, I can't highlight how exciting this is for the state of Minnesota and thanks to the support of the legislature. Our MinPro lab, it's the only lab in the state with RT Quick functionality. We are expanding this um, uh, our RT Quick uh, capabilities. We are working with the USDA to validate to validate RT Quick as a as a diagnostic tool that's going to be useful both for the farm servant industry, but also for we think uh, for 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 hunting, right? So we're working with the USDA now on the validation of RT Quick. We're part of a multi-state CWD research consortium. Um, and we have formed an RT Quick network. And so over the next year, we're going to be using the same protocol that the USDA is using to validate. And that work is going to be ongoing. Our current throughput, and this is all based on the current equipment that we have. We have four now, four of these microplate readers. Uh, we just received two, two additional new microplate readers, I believe, last week. So now, now, as of this week, we have the capacity for 104 samples every 48 hours. Future upgrades, both using, uh, uh, using the equipment that we currently have, we can get up to 488 samples per, for, per 48 hours. We can go to a 384 well format, basically, in each one of those machines. That gets us to a 488 samples. As we acquire more equipment, if we hire additional staff, that can expand. Okay, some of the largest labs in the country, like at Colorado State, they have about 12 to 15 of those microplate readers and are able to um, do many RT quick reactions all at once. So what we're hoping is to get to that level. All right, so the good, the good news about RT quick, it's highly sensitive test. It can be used with a variety of samples. It's much better than current diagnostic tools. The bad though, is that it requires special reagents that are costly and time consuming to uh, produce. Okay, and so that's a logistical hurdle. The ugly part of RT quick is that it's highly te technical. You need specialized staff. It's not quick. It's not quick. It's not like the name. It, you, you, it takes, can take hours. It can take a few days, depending on the sample type. Um, and special equipment is needed to do that. So the bottom line is RT Quick is a major step forward. We believe that uh, this is the next generation that's of, of CW diagnostic testing that's going to be, going to be um, implemented across the United States, especially once the USDA validates it in the coming year or two. But we still need to develop a deer side field deployable test. Right, so RT Quick's not a silver bullet. We still need to simplify it and really get things out into a DNR field station, a deer side test. Okay, that's that's uh, what we're moving towards. All right, and I want to shift gears real quick and talk a little bit about the education and outreach that we're performing. And this is through uh, um, a lot of the work that Dr. Tiffany Wolf has uh, uh, been performing and will be performing. I'll highlight some of the work that's upcoming. Program manager Mark Schwabenlander is doing a great job, and Dr. Roxanne Larson, assistant professor in the College of Vet Med, is helping with this as well. So, over the last year, we've reached over 5,400 Minnesotans through in person and Zoom, now Zoom outreach events. We've transitioned due to COVID 19 to more Zoom outreach events. And so we're really trying to adapt that outreach in response to COVID-19. Just recently, and, and there's a PDF I think that most of y'all have, uh, we've generated, and let me try to get my view here so I can see. So if you look at my presenter view, you can see this booklet that we generated. Um, this is a, a Hmong translation. Um, and we also have, uh, we have multiple versions that we can use. So there's on the inside cover, there's a glossary of terms. Okay, a glossary of terms for CWD, and this really shows, if you go through the booklet, it shows 
Um, it talks about the biology of be how it works, how it can spread through the deer, okay? So we're trying to help educate the public, help ed educate youth hunters, but also the gen general public about this disease. We also developed an insert that can change year to year um, that shows uh, its statistics, you know, from Minnesota, like where CWD has been described before, um, some useful information for hunters, uh, pointing them to the DNR uh, webpage. So this is an insert that we'll be able to modify and update you know, in the coming years in different versions. We're going to distribute hard copies of this in mid-September to try to get this out um, uh, to, to folks before hunting season ramps up. Okay. We've also produced, this is really exciting, a 3D, a full-size 3D white-dailed deer head to assist with lymph node sampling and education. This is something that, that the DNR is excited about. The USDA is really excited about this. So I'm showing you this full-sized white-tailed deer head in a retropharyngeal lymph node just fell out. So this, this deer head, before COVID hit, we printed this and we wanted to take this and, and bring it out and show the public and have uh, uh, copies of this maybe at DNR field stations and, and, and provide maybe to the Board of Animal Health to help train on how to take samples uh, for the farm servant industry. COVID hit, can't really distribute things like this, but nevertheless, we can expand on this. And as we get COVID under control, we can distribute this. Um, what it shows is that you can go down. And so these are our salivary glands. There's, it's been cut here. Where you, this is the most common tissue that's misidentified for um, uh, uh, retropharyngeal lymph nodes, but you can dig in there and you can actually pull out using tweezers, a retropharyngeal lymph node. And so um, we're really excited about this. This is a, a product of uh, uh, Roxy Larson and Mark Schwab and Lander's work. And so we're going to expand on that. Um, and the USDA is interested in, 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 in having those models across the United States to help train people on how to take samples for testing. There's a video that highlights this on the link there on the page. We're also organizing CWD webinars beginning in October. These are four one-hour sessions. It'll be 30 minutes of, of, of talking, 30 minutes of questions. I'll do the first two basics of CWD, giving my slinky talk, right? How to explain what is a prion? How, how, does, it, how does it spread? Talking about ecology and diagnostic tools. Then Corey Anderson from SIDRAP. So we're gonna be working more and more with SIDRAP and how to coordinate SIDRAP's doing the policy, right? Work on policy and we're helping with education uh, uh, without, throughout Minnesota, trying to get to the general public. So we're gonna join forces and, and work together on this. And Corey's gonna give that third talk. Um, and then the DNR is gonna pr provide the fourth talk. So you can see uh, we're scheduling these now, the dates are there across the bottom. Mark Schwabenlander um, is going to be the, uh, the host for those and organizing that and I appreciate all the work that he's doing. Really quickly here to finish up, we're also engaging, this is thanks to the trust fund, LCCMR, we're engaging culturally diverse uh, hunting communities on CWD outreach. And this is led by Dr. Tiffany Wolf, Mark Schwab and Lander. And in the, I just added this uh, this morning, you can see like we need to have everyone come together. This needs to be a collaborative effort um, that brings together government agencies, researchers, policymakers on this issue in order to get in front of CWD in the state. And, and Tiffany Wolf and Mark is gonna be leading efforts to outreach to our tribal nations, but also the Hmong and Amish communities. This paper, I just wanna highlight this right at the end here. This is a paper that came out just a few weeks ago out of Dr. Hoover's lab at Colorado State. Um, I wanted to share this with everyone. It, it, this shows, the bottom line of this paper is it shows they use challenge experiments, challenge experiments using white-tailed deer um, uh, at their facility in Colorado State. They showed the minimum infectious dose to transmit chronic wasting disease about 300 nanograms of CWD positive brain material. If you do the math on that, you have like about 2.5 grams, something that weighs the size of, of a penny, has a potential to infect millions of deer, okay? So this is how infectious this agent is. And that's why it's so difficult. It helps us to understand why it's so difficult to manage in, in the wild, in the survey industry. It's because it's so infectious and we need to identify ways um, to catch it early and to, to mitigate it. With that, I wanna thank all the funding sources uh, um, for all their assistance. And I'll go ahead and I will stop uh, screen sharing and then open up the floor to questions. Thank you, Dr. Larson and uh, Dr. Wolf and Mr. Schwabenauer are also available for questions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So I have two uh, hands up. Uh, Representative Rob Eklund. 
Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Larson, for the presentation and your ongoing uh, research on this. I, I, as, a, as a deer hunter in northern Minnesota, I really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Larson, have you been contacted by the Board of Animal Health? And how does your research work in with their proposed rulemaking? Dr. Larson. Thank you for the question. Chair Hansen, and Birds and members of the committee. We have, uh, I have communicated with the Board of Animal Health um, uh, off and on for the last year about uh, RT Quick, about getting this uh, method up and running. Um, we have submitted a grant proposal recently with the Board of Animal Health, with Dr. Scott Wells at, at, at uh, uh, in CVM here at the University of Minnesota to use RT Quick as a method to look at prions on farms that have gone positive over the past, past five years. Have I been contacted specifically about trying to help advise uh, with the board on scientific uh, um, issues relating to CWD? I have not specifically. Uh, Mr. Chair. Well, no, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I guess, um, you know, this has been a topic that we've been debating over and over and over again at the legislature for two years. And I just find it troubling that when we have research going on at the University of Minnesota that our Board of Animal Health isn't consulting with them because I think this should be more of a cooperative effort. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Larson for um, uh, covering some of the outreach effort that the university have done. And it's really exciting to see that, you know, you have translated uh, materials in Hmong and are working for our our tribal uh, nations. But one uh, question that I have, Dr. Larson, is that, is that uh, my understanding is you are seeking some changes to a project that was funded through the Emergent Issues account for the outreach to diverse hunting communities. Can you inform us uh, to what those changes are? And I'll ask uh, Dr. Dr. Wolf. Dr. Wolf. And if Dr. Wolf, you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Tiffany Wolf. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Um, thank you, Representative Lee, for your question. Um, we have recently submitted an amendment to our work plan related to the Emerging Issues Fund study. Um, the reason for that is we are responding to changing dynamics associated with the COVID-19 social distancing uh, guidelines that are in place. And where our initial plans were to um, really get out into communities um, and do a lot more uh, in-person outreach, um, we recognized that a lot of those opportunities are going away. Um, we also, in a lot of discussions we've had um, with tribal biologists, as well as other researchers, uh, CWD researchers around the country, um, are recognizing that there's also a need to do more work up front that helps to inform what these outre outreach materials look like. So getting information on cultural perceptions of risk associated with wildlife disease and societal trust as a way to help us identify what the best message is, as well as, as what the knowledge gaps are in these specific communities so that we can in, use the best approach and provide the best information that these communities need. Um, that kind of work still needs to be done. And so given the limitations we have in physically getting into these communities and making connections to deliver outreach, we're gonna take a step back and work through community partners to gather the kind of information that we think is important to inform how we develop that outreach material. And so that's really the primary motivation behind the changes to that work plan. Representative Lee, a follow-up? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Dr. Wolf, can you specifically talk to uh, uh, the piece around um, 
doing the survey where right now you're focusing on, I think initially these, the survey will be hitting the Southeast Asian uh, communities and the Amish community, but right now uh, the proposed amendment is to only do survey in tribal nations, correct? Um, thank you, Rep Representative Hansen, Mr. Chairman. Um, that's primarily related to activity two. So in activity one, um, we're going to be reaching out to all communities, tribal, Amish, Hmong, um, to gather the information we're looking for based on CWD knowledge, perceptions of risk, et cetera. Um, we're taking a different approach rather than using surveys, but um, uh, trying to work with community liaisons to actually do uh, hold focus groups, small um, group to gather information um, or one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. Activity two is where we have scaled back to really focus on surveys of, of uh, tribal hunters. And the reason for that is we are working closely with the DNR on this, um, and they have conducted surveys of hunters, um, primarily targeting hunters in the deep deer permit areas where CWD is endemic, um, but also random hunter surveys throughout the state to try and gather information on hunter behavior, um, as well as responses to the regulations that are in place by the DNR. Um, and our, our collaborators at the DNR feel like they've gotten very good information cross-sectionally from the hunting communities. And so repeating that with the Southeast Asian and Hmong communities um, would be a bit somewhat redundant. Um, where it is important to do them in the tribal communities is related to the fact that in the next one to two years, tribal nations are gonna be rolling out CWD surveillance of their own on reservation land. And, but right now, most if not all of them don't have plans in place on how they would respond if there were detection. So if detections did occur, there would be a lot of scrambling um, to work with the DNR as, as, as well as um, USDA. There was a system-wide mute. I don't know what happened there. Um, okay, thanks, Peter. I'm not sure um, where, <laughs> where where that occurred and what I was Just saying. Just the last two sec, like literally last five seconds. Okay, so uh, so this kind of information is not only important for helping tribal biologists develop. CWD management plans for reservations, but it also will enhance participation in surveillance um, by, by uh, directing, making connections with those tribal hunters and really directing our outreach efforts. Thank, thank you. Uh, Representative Lee, did you have one more follow-up? We do have Senator Thomas Oney. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, last follow-up, and maybe this is for the DNR. Um, just wanted to get an understanding of what the DNR is doing that, uh, you know, they're saying that their outreach is enough, so that's why we're changing away the focus from the survey from the uh, Southeast Asian and the Amish community, please. Maybe um, uh, would uh, Dr. Carsonson uh, uh, respond to that during her presentation? Is that possible? I think so. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Thomasoni. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do Dr. Larson, I, I, we've had this discussion um, of several different times. Does, as a result of the RT Quick now, I, I know before the only way that we could uh, detect the prions were to actually have brain samples. And that while we think it was could be transmitted through number of different ways such as uh, feces or saliva or urine that we actually didn't really know before if it could be is does the rt quick now give us the ability to actually check the those those, those other ways of transfer uh, transmit transmission to to 
actually confirm that we're that's where we're finding it is and um, is our, our plants also the uh, another potential place where they, we can find transmission. Great, Dr. Larson, Chair Hansen, Inger Britson. So yes, we can use RT Quick to check for those prions, those CW prions in urine, in feces, in soil. We can check for their presence or absence, okay? That's, we can use RT Quick to do that. We have protocols to do that. Now, can, uh, for your second question, can plants bring in uh, prions? There are two publications out there showing where they, in a laboratory, grew wheatgrass in uh, prion contaminated soil, and there were prions in the leaves, and those prions were infectious. And so the problem is there's only two papers, two studies out there. And based on that information, Norway in 2018 banned the importation of hay or straw from CWD positive regions. So in our laboratory, we understand, you know, we need to have research to understand are the prions really being uptaken and what variety of plants are there? Because I view this as a major concern for our for agricultural commodities and we need to do research to better understand this and get ahead of it and get in front of it so mr chairman and Dr. just just give me an idea now about so the, the way we've been tracing it in in the, the past has been that uh okay so the deer hunters kill four thousand deer and we check uh, the brains in a certain area of the state and we find that 11 deer were positive and determine whether or not we have a problem is the fact that we can now test uh, other samples such as feces is is does that give us an indication of how widespread it is or is it just a, a luck of the draw type thing um, and uh, how much how much better is our information now as a result of this dr larson chair hansen member of the committee members of the committee rt quick is a much more sensitive test rt quick can identify positive animals that are maybe a month or two or three into the infection cycle. It's much more sensitive. The current tests that are being used will have a, have a failure rate where they could miss or not detect those early infections. We believe that over time, as RT Quick gets widely adopted, we'll have a better view, a more accurate view of where CWD is in the wild. So I hope that helps answer the question is, it's just a, it's a resolution issue right? Like where you have a pretty coarse resolution right now with the diagnostic tests that are currently provided, RT Quick represents a next generation that gives you much better resolution. And if you can find those infections that are earlier or may have been missed by other, those other tools, then we can help manage, right? Manage the disease in, in a different way. So, so let me, let me just try this, Mr. Sherman, one, one more quick question. So um, in, in the, in the instance of actually doing uh, brain samples, you know exactly which animal it is. Um, in the case of doing feces, is it, how, how do you know if you're testing the same animal two or three or four times, or if it's a, a different animal, and are we just tracking the animals in some way so that we know uh, what we're testing? Because I, I think it's really important that we're able to test live animals now, but, but how do we know which ones we're doing and whether or not we're doing the same one over and over again? Dr. Larson. Chair Hansen, Ingerbritson, members of the committee. So uh, view, it, view the fecal uh, component of this, the environmental component. Like if you have an area where deer congregate, let's say it's a natural mineral lick or the corner of an alfalfa field. If you have an area where deer congregate and you're able to detect the prions in that geographic area, then that could tell you that the herd at some level, there's at least maybe one individual or more that are potentially positive for CWD. So you talk about herd surveillance, that's a way that you can leverage RT quick is to get it the, on, on the live animal side of things. I will say this, like for, for the, for tissue, for, for harvested hunt, uh, hunter harvested deer, right? The lymph node, the brain, those will always be valuable tissues to look at because that's just where the prions naturally accumulate. Okay. So view it like there's there's several uh, scales here. You can do environmental sampling at the hot spots, like a natural mineral lick, uh, a, a place where, where deer congregate. But then you can also you will also 
you can always leverage the a lymph node or brain material from a hunter harvested animal or an animal harvested from the service in, servant industry because that's where the prions congregate naturally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, and then uh, we'll move on to the DNR. I, I, I think we shorted uh, uh, Dr. Larson at the last meeting, so I'm willing to give him a little more time here on answering questions. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and hopefully this will be a quick one. I just wanted to clarify um, from the, the previous discussion and question um, that we do know that the prions are can be found in blood and urine. That's not a question. The difference with RT Quick is that we can test it more easily. Um, and because it's so sensitive, we can find the prions there. But there isn't, so the clarification I'm asking for do, from Dr. Larson is that um, there isn't a question about whether prions can be find in, uh, found in blood and urine um, feces. Uh, it's just, we've always used the lymph nodes and the brain because those are the ones where the highest number of the prions are going to be found. Dr. Yes. Larson. Chair Hanson, members of the committee, yes, that is absolutely correct. It's because the current diagnostic tools could only use tissues where those prions are enriched. But with RT Quick, it's so sensitive that you can detect it in blood uh, and urine. And this has already been shown experimentally out of the main RT Quick labs at Colorado State and Rocky Mountain National Labs. That's correct. Representative Becker Finn, did you have a follow up? Yeah, real quick. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Larson. But so for the public that are listening, there isn't a question about whether it can be trans CWD and preens can be transferred in blood and urine. It's just now we've got a better tool to find it. Dr. Correct. Larson. Yes, that is correct. Thank you, uh, Dr. Larson and team. And uh, your contact information is on the, uh, can't, on the committee uh, site if people have any questions for you and can follow up later. Uh, thank you. Next, we'll move on to the DNR and Dr. Carstensen. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will attempt to share my screen here. Let me know if this is uh, visible, Mr. Chair. Looks good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for having me here today. Um, my name is Dr. Michelle Carstensen, and I am currently the uh, Wildlife Health Program Supervisor for Minnesota DNR, and I'm also acting as our research manager uh, for the time being. With me today, I have Jamie Gangaware, also with DNR, and Dave Benke with the Pollution Control Agency, who will be joining me uh, later in the presentation to cover some other topics uh, in their purview. So I'd like to begin with an overview. Uh, Going to go forward here. There we go. Um, so we have an outline today of, of what I'm going to talk about in our 20 minutes. I'd like to give you a recap of what happened this past fall, just so that's fresh in folks' minds, and then talk about our new areas. Unfortunately, we do have new areas of disease to uh, to work on this year. We have three new areas. I'll go over briefly. Um, we'll talk about our dumpster program and land, working with landfills, and then some of the changes we have uh, coming this fall for our CWD surveillance efforts in light of COVID. And I'll conclude with a quick update on our Southeast Deer Movement Study. So from last year, um, we had a, a very um, successful effort in collecting samples. We had nearly uh, 18,000 samples collected uh, during the hunting season. Um, you can see here on this slide, the focus was the North Central area, um, which is around Brainerd. We had the central area around Meeker County and then a lot in the southeast. Um, so um, we did find 23 new positives through the fall hunting season last year, and all of those were in southeast Minnesota. We did not find any positive detections in our north central zone or in the central area. Um, additionally, after the main hunting season, we collected another thousand samples through some late hunts in the southeast. We had some landowner shooting permits, and then we did a winter agency culling effort with USDA Wildlife Services targeting areas where disease was detected this past fall. So that was really focused on specific sections in southeast Minnesota. 
And through that work, we did identify another 10 positives, again, all in the same area in Southeast Minnesota that we know we have the disease. And additionally, we had just over 350 deer sampled across the state that uh, come to us from various causes um, where they're reported sick or their road kills or found dead. And we did find three more positives that way, again, in the Southeast. To date, we've sampled over 90,000 deer since 2002, and we've had 88 total positive cases, um, and that's in six counties, uh, Olmstead, Fillmore, Winona, Houston, Crow Wing, and Dakota. Um, where we have the disease to that greatest extent is in Fillmore County area, and this is the outbreak we've been managing since 2016. And as you can see here, the prevalence is still really low, right? So we're at 1% this last year. So we believe we have an infection persisting in this area. And that's why this has been a focus of our, our effort for the winter is really trying to not have this disease spread outside this area, trying to uh, lower prevalence if possible, and really try to maintain low disease uh, in this area if, if we can't uh, drive it the other direction into less disease, which would be ideal. This past year, we spent over $2.7 million on our CWD-related work. Um, on this slide here, you can see some of the breakdowns of those costs. Um, the work of collecting these samples and testing them um, is extremely expensive. So between staff time and, uh, and the various contracts to get this work done, you know, that's a huge amount of this cost comes into that effort. Again, we also contracted with USDA for the culling assistance. Uh, the dumpster program is in here for just over 185,000. Um, and then we had research projects that we've been working on related to CWD, deer movements, and genetics uh, for another 156. And so the sources of this money from this past year largely came from our general fund appropriation. Uh, 1.5 million was spent there, game and fish appropriation, and then also DNR dedicated accounts. So looking forward into 2020 here, into this fall, uh, as I mentioned, we have these three new areas of disease. I'll walk you through each of these briefly, but just to orient you here with the state picture, we're talking about the West Central Surveillance, which is an area around Douglas County. We have an East Central Surveillance area. This is in Pine County area. And then we have a new um, CWD management zone in Dak Dakota County. Um, we will continue to have work going in the north central area around Brainerd uh, and in the southeast where we have uh, all of the infection that we've been finding. We did successfully um, discontinue the central surveillance area around Meeker County after we had three consecutive years of testing over 4,000 deer and not finding any disease. And that area again was created because of a servant farm that was found positive several years ago and we did not find any disease in the wild there and we've discontinued that effort. So if we take a look at Douglas County briefly, um, there was a servant farm found positive there that had just two animals. Um, one of them was positive, the female, and the male was not detected. And this uh, farm was really new. It had only really been um, a, a present for about 10 months before the disease was found on the facility. And uh, the source of that animal that was infected uh, came from Pine County Farm. And so we did visit the site uh, and do some surveillance, uh, sorry, a survey flight to look at deer abundance uh, and presence near the farm to get a set better sense of risk. Fortunately, um, this area was um, very open and didn't have a lot of good uh, cover for deer around the facility. So that idea of fence line contact uh, was minimized because of the, the layout of that land. And we did not find a lot of deer present in the area. And so given the, the risk factors were lower with this farm because the animals were there for less time, and again, less deer presence around the facility, we decided to take this opportunity to try out um, a newer um, surveillance model called risk-based uh, surveillance model, which has been used in several other states. And instead of just collecting with this idea a set amount of deer, it takes into account the age sex makeup of the deer in your sample, giving more weight to older bucks or actual deer that have clinical symptoms of a sickness that give you um, um, a higher value sample because they'll have a higher likelihood to have the disease. So this effort builds in a point system that, that targets um, each area uh, based again on this age sex structure of of our sample. And so we also looked at other factors to influence how many points we believe we need to collect based on deer densities in the area, presence of servant farms, distance to other wild positives, and we've set these surveillance goals. Um, and so this hopefully will 
be very successful in this area and something that we might be able to implement um, across other areas of the state in the future. So we're excited to see how this risk-based model works. In our Pine County area, it's a little different scenario. This again is the farm where the, the one positive female from Douglas County was purchased. Um, this farm had more infection um, in addition to an animal that died on the farm and was tested for chronic wasting disease and found positive. They did find five cases total out of the nine deer in that herd after they were depopulated. Um, and this, this scenario is, is a higher risk for the wild deer because there's a greater deer density uh, right around that farm. It's very wooded, uh, really close to the Wisconsin border, so a lot more deer present. And again, they had um, deer interaction right at the fence line, evidence of tracks um, right outside the facility. So a lot more risk um, for there to have been some transmission potential so in this area, we have uh, a new um, surveillance area created. You can see this highlighted here in, in the slide. We're calling this our East Central Surveillance Area. And uh, we're trying to collect a total of 1,000 samples during the deer hunting season. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, we do not find disease. But we'll be doing this work for at least three years, which is the incubation period for chronic waste and disease on the high end. And we are communicating with Wisconsin, have shared our maps and plans, um, and are encouraging surveillance to increase on their side of the border, although they do have some additional limitations this year in Wisconsin for how much surveillance they'll be conducting. And we will continue to share information with them. Um, in our Dakota County area, this was uh, a new area where we found the disease in a wild deer. The actual deer is pictured here on this slide. So this animal was reported from a member of the public um, as uh, emaciated, um, exhibiting neurologic behavior, really, really poor condition, and uh, was dispatched by a conservation officer. And the carcass was brought to the University of Minnesota's diagnostic lab for full necropsy. And it was concluded that CWD was the cause of this animal's illness. As you can see in the slide, we really haven't done a lot of surveillance in this south metro area for quite some time. So this is not only a new detection in the wild, but without good historical information to know how long this might be here, where it came from, and, and really how large of a problem we're dealing with. And so uh, to account for that, we not only have created a new permit area called 605 that encompasses you know, a 15 mile radius around that, that new positive bumped out to navigable uh, boundaries. Um, we also have a, a surveillance area surrounding it, kind of a buffer area, where we're going to try to collect 750 samples to basically see how extensive this disease might be in the area and give us some more confidence um, that, uh, that we're, if it is really uh, localized to Dakota County, that we're going to have enough samples to help inform uh, how much disease is in the landscape here. So this work will continue for at least three years with a new boundary like 605 being created as a management zone that comes with a dumpster uh, program will go there we'll have um, mandatory uh, carcass movement restrictions just like our other management areas so when there is known disease in the wild uh, we have a lot more um, tools that we use to try to keep it from spreading outside of that area so those are our three new areas and we will be maintaining um, all of the surveillance levels and, and efforts that we've been doing in north central and the southeast management zones and control areas um, as we had last year so there's no changes in these zones um, same boundaries um, we will have um, sampling available for the duration of all firearm seasons in these areas the carcass movement restrictions continue and there will be dumpsters and quartering stations available throughout these zones very similar to last year um, when here i have a slide on the dumpster program and jamie if you're available okay can you hear me michelle I can. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm Jamie Gangwer. I am uh, uh, the De Operations and Development Supervisor for Fish and Wildlife at the DNR. Um, this year, I came on board with Wildlife Health to uh, assist with the dumpster program and all of the um, coordination that takes place to get the dumpsters on the landscape. So, last year, uh, it was led. The effort was led by Brian Luce, and he retired earlier this spring. So it is me now. Um, but we had over 200 tons of deer waste generated last year. And as Michelle mentioned, um, the cost was about $185,000. So we're going to continue the dumpster program in the north central and the southeast. Uh, we added dumpsters in the metro in 605. We have a total of um, 33 dumpster locations 
there are six in the North Central, seven in the Metro, and 20 in the Southeast. Um, all bids were out. Actually, most of them were due back yesterday. Uh, so we're already busy putting contracts in place. Um, there are a few bids that were a little delayed getting out of our office. So they're due on the third um, and it's going well. So we had a lot of interest. We were able to bid out to local vendors um, this year. Waste management declined, and um, so we had an exemption to uh, to just bypass having to solicit directly from them. And um, yes, and then require functional lids this time. So we included photographs of what we expect for lids, and we are requiring photographs back um, of what their dumpsters look like from these vendors. Um, we have contacted some deer hunting groups and there have been deer hunting groups that have or other sportsmen groups that have contacted us with interest in supporting the program. So what we're doing is more data gathering this year, you know, DNR, we love data, but so we're going to be able to present groups with total costs per dumpster site um, with hopes that moving into 2021, we will be able to have groups adopt an entire site for the entire duration of that dumpsters um, cycle there. So that's where we're at with an adopted dumpster program. Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Dave Benke, are you available? Yes, I am, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. My name is Dave Benke. I'm the director of the Resource Management and Assistance Division at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So once you put the dumpsters out, you've got to have a place for that waste to go. Um, and that's where the agency comes in. We've been working with uh, the areas uh, for surveillance and trying to make sure we have a disposal location uh, that can match the RFPs that have been put out so that there's something uh, available uh, for each one of those areas. We know that if the deer gets left on the landscape, that's the worst thing that can happen. So getting those into a landfill or into a, a disposal system uh, is the best thing. Uh, making sure that we have that contained uh, and properly disposed. Um, right now, we have not seen through any of the research that there's a health risk associated with the landfill. Um, the advisory is with eating the positive uh, venison, and so we need to make sure that we can get the butcher remains disposed of properly. So like I said, we've been assisting the DNR to identify landfills, to identify waste energy facilities, to identify air curtain incinerator options that can be utilized for the dumpster programs in the areas of surveillance. So in the West Central, we've been discussing things with Pope Douglas uh, at their waste energy facility to be able to manage uh, the uh, waste in that area. We've got some positive uh, feedback from them. Um, this won't be the same uh, level of, of uh, numbers. It's a targeted number of, of samples uh, through the DNR uh, because it's not a wild population. Uh, it was in a captive herd. Uh, the same thing with the uh, East Central. And we have landfills that are available in that area. Um, we've advised the landfills on how to manage the prions to continue to reduce risk uh, the same thing in the South Metro uh, with the local landfills there to help manage things. And in the North Central, you'll probably re remember from our previous conversations that the uh, Crow Wing County put in place an air curtain incinerator to manage uh, the carcasses. Uh, this was a wild population, so it was a mandatory testing and a higher volume of, of material uh, from not only the hunters, but from the local uh, butchers and venison processors. Uh, so the air curtain incinerators really worked out well in terms of managing what comes in. Uh, we learned a lot about how to use it and uh, we'll continue that uh, in that area. In the Southeast, we utilized uh, La Crosse County landfill. Uh, they've been managing uh, deer carcasses and remains from uh, Wisconsin for a number of years. And a lot of the waste that's generated in uh, the Southeast ends up going that direction anyway, and so managing it that way uh, made a lot of sense. We're still working with Olmstead County on the northern end of that surveillance area and their waste energy systems to try and find an option there uh, in case there's some type of uh, carcass restrictions with Wisconsin or some types of movement restrictions uh, that would require us to manage those uh, in the state. Um, you know, in terms of the Actual chronic wasting disease positive deer, the DNR still tries to recover those and any confirmed ones that they recover, they'll use the alkaline digester 
for disposal. So we're trying to minimize the risk, keep the uh, waste off the landscape, uh, and make sure that we can have a uh, positive impact on what's going on here by not uh, having deer left on the landscape for uh, potential exposure to other deer. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, so just a few more slides for me. Um, I wanted to mention that we did expand our deer fatting, feeding and attractant ban um, because of these new detections in three areas of the state that also expanded accordingly. So we have um, new places where feeding or feeding or attractants are not allowed. So the addition of the attractants is always when we have disease uh, in the wild. And so we're, we're trying to minimize uh, the chance that deer are being drawn to an area and potentially exchanging fluids as uh, Dr. Larson was discussing earlier. So talking about 2020 a little bit more specifically, uh, we did change from uh, the mandatory sampling that we had done in the last couple of years to a voluntary based effort. And this is to minimize the chances of disease transmission uh, between hunters, uh, between hunters and our staff or hunters and the students that we have working with us um, because we didn't want to force a requirement that uh, folks had to interact uh, when they didn't feel safe. Our sampling goals for this year are designed to maintain a high level of confidence in all of our areas. We're expecting 99% confidence that we can detect a disease if they're in over 1% of the population. So our targets are still very high. We believe that we're still going to get good information to understand where the disease is and isn't with this effort. Um, Hunters that uh, do not um, uh, uh, make it to a CWD self-service station um, can have an option to make an appointment with a wildlife staff. Um, and so we are setting up that ability uh, where they'd stay in the truck and a DNR staff person could come out and meet with them. And this can happen uh, again by appointment. Um, we've made partnerships with over 50 taxidermists in our zones uh, to collect samples for us. And then we pay them a fee. And we're also partnering with some meat processors um, as a new effort to see how that can work and potentially um, be another source of samples in the future. As I mentioned earlier, the carcass movement restrictions stay in place for all of our disease management areas. And uh, where we intend to actually take the samples this year will all be extraction sites at uh, DNR buildings, staffed by DNR staff and uh, university students as well. Our communications um, are continuing at a very high level. Um, in addition to press releases and deer notes that we put out with social media blasts about CWD, uh, we have all the information in this year's regs book, hunting regs book, that includes where our stations are and all of the things we talked about already today is available in the book. We keep the website up to date all the time for any changes and direct folks there um, for locations of the dumpsters uh, as an example and, and how to find those. Um, we have new metal signs that we created for public lands to make sure folks know if they're at a WMA, whether or not they're in a uh, CWD management zone or not. Um, we're increased our signage at our stations to make sure the self-service stations are more visible, uh, continue to make sure the dumpsters are visible with more signage and larger signage um, that we were using last year in certain sites. We've updated again um, some of our videos for helping hunters understand how to cape deer and, um, and how to um, quarter deer if they're going to leave the zone. And uh, we are also doing some mass mailings for hunters that are licensed in these new um, permit areas that we're working in uh, so that they know for sure that there's a change to the, the hunting that uh, they're used to. So any of these new zones that I talked about, the three new areas, all licensed hunters that hunt typically in those permit areas are going to be getting a mailing from DNR very soon uh, to let them know of, of the changes. Um, real briefly, uh, I wanted to talk quickly about the deer movement study in the southeast, uh, which was largely funded by uh, LCCMR dollars. And so we're in our third year here with this, and we have some really interesting information that we just shared in a final report to LCCMR. Um, if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to, to forward that report to the committees. But we have an interesting movement dynamics that we're seeing in these yearling deer. Um, so they're collared as fawns in their first winter. We're looking to see how far they disperse and have that potential to take disease with them. Um, it's good to know that the vast majority of deer are staying um, close enough to their natal ranges that they are um, well contained within the bounds of our current CWD management areas. So our 15 mile buffers tend to be um, sufficient for, for dispersal events, although there are some anomalies to that with some long distance movers, as you can see in this map, as the gray dots indicate, some have moved into Iowa, 
some moved up north, but the direction of movement is very interesting here in that it's been to the west. So these deer that are primarily collared around the Preston Fillmore periphery are not moving towards Wisconsin. Um, in any of the cases that we've been looking at for movers, they're moving west, um, slightly south or slightly north, but but west, west direction, which uh, again gives us more um, information to, to continue our, our buffer areas and, and collecting samples in that direction to safeguard first disease spread in that area. One thing we're looking for this coming winter when we have one more year of, of catching animals is to try to fill in a gap in that Houston County area to see if, if deer along the river um, in that area are actually exchanging with Wisconsin or not. And uh, can we pick up some of these movements that might uh, indicate disease across the, across the border and across the river in particular, or directions closer to where uh, Iowa has their largest infection, which is in Alan McKee County. Um, if there's uh, any more interest in this project, uh, we do have a lot online on our website for the study. And again, I'd be happy to share any reports to members of the committees of where we're at currently with this project. And with that, I just wanted to say in summary that CWD remains a rare disease in Minnesota, which is still a good thing. Uh, we do have it in certain areas, but we have it at very low levels and we're working diligently to try to continue to have it um, be less present <laughs> or uh, at least less risk in other parts of our state. Um, we have an aggressive approach that's maintained here through our hunting season. Even though our sampling became voluntary, we have changed nothing in our aggressive approach to managing the disease with the number of available licenses and tags. Sorry, in our harvest strategies, we're going to continue with culling this coming winter. So all of those tools are still in place and extremely important in trying to manage this disease. Um, we will adapt as we can to make sure that we remain effective in our work and that we cannot be successful without the help of our hunters and cooperators and businesses and landowners in this effort, because uh, we all have to be in this together to make sure that we can do the best we can for this resource. With that, I will uh, take any questions the committee might have or my co-presenters. Uh, Dr. Carstensen, could you follow up on Representative Lee's question earlier on uh, outreach and engagement with the Southeast Asian community? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I, I can. Um, I believe what was uh, referenced there was the fact that um, we have conducted both landowner and hunter surveys in Southeast Minnesota, where we have the disease um, at the highest levels that we anywhere in the state. And in those surveys, um, the hunting public that had registered deer in those areas were all um, encouraged to participate. So I believe Dr. Wolf was referencing that Southeast Asian hunters were already a part of that outreach for the, the hunter survey. And that information has been uh, analyzed and, and is available in a report that I'm happy to share with the committee. So I think the um, what she referenced was that the hunting community engaged in that survey included Southeast Asian hunters as well. They weren't specifically target, they were just represented as part of the hunting community surveyed at that time. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would follow up with the DNR and the university uh, offline, thanks. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and first, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing to do the outreach to the taxidermists and meat processors. I think that's um, uh, in a sort of obvious uh, group to be reaching out to as far as getting those samples. But I think that's a really important step in, in catching some of these and making sure we're working with people who know how to find the right the right samples. So I'm glad to hear that work is, is happening. Um, as far as the outreach to um, the public, are we are you doing some of the the outreach at like licensed sellers that are outside of the zones? For example, I usually buy my license and you know pick up my booklet at at Joe's Sporting Goods in Little Canada, but I don't hunt in Ramsey County. I hunt in other counties throughout the state. So is that um, outreach and signage happening at other large? Um, licensed sellers outside of the actual CWD zones. Dr. Carson. Mr. Chair and Representative Beckerfin, um, I don't believe that we are putting up signs or posters at big game stations outside of our surveillance areas or management zones. Um, that is not, to my current understanding, an effort that we are doing. Uh, there is posters and signage um, for big game uh, registration stations inside our zones. That being said, um, there it, it, as 
this information is available in the hunting regs book itself. So if a hunter outside of an area is buying a license and receives the book at the time of purchase, the CWD information is uh, well within that, that booklet, but not specifically in a poster at those sites. Dr. Finn, follow up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would I would really encourage you to reconsider that. I mean, we know the number of licenses sold in Ramsey and Hennepin County, that those are the highest number of licenses sold, but obviously the vast majority of us don't hunt in, in Ramsey and Hennepin County. That's just where we live. And so I think that would be uh, probably not that expensive. I'm sure you can see, you know, where the top sellers are. I'm sure it's, you know, Cabela's and the sporting goods places. Um, but I would really encourage you to reconsider that and make sure we're doing that outreach to those hunters as well. Cause I, I have my booklet right here, but obviously, as we all know, like that's a lot of information and in very small print. Um, so I think making sure that that's really highlighted is, um, is going to be important. Uh, and then the, my, my final question is just, um, when you're doing the outreach, now that we have this Metro zone is outreach being done to any of the cities that do their own culling as well, so that they know, um, that this change is happening and, you know, cities could maybe choose to do their own outreach to their communities through their, um, you know, whether it's their, their parks boards or whatever it is where that would fall under their jurisdiction. Cause I know even in my suburban cities, several of them have deer calling that happens, um, because the population is so high, um, and we have problems with the deer congregating in certain areas. So just wondering if, uh, what kind of outreach is happening to, you know, municipalities and smaller level local government. Dr. Carson Sinden, before you answer, could you take your, uh, screen down and that would make it easier for people to see if you could stop sharing the screen and then, uh, if you could answer Representative Becker Finn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep, Mr. Chair, Representative Finn, um, for on the first point, uh, I absolutely agree um, with your uh, suggestion about continuing outreach uh, for some of those other um, big game stations that you referenced. And I will talk with our communication staff after this meeting about that. Um, when it comes to the South Metro, uh, yeah, we've been very engaged in all of the available types of hunts that occur there, um, including uh, the Metro Bow Hunters Association that does quite a bit of, of specific hunts uh, in certain areas, uh, the city administrators. So we have had, um, luckily, good contacts with folks that are are involved in all of these special hunt scenarios and have uh, set up collections for samples throughout all of those metro hunts that are going to be occurring from now throughout the season. So I believe we're very engaged in the available types of harvest that happen in the South Metro and have folks on board to help us collect samples and encourage participation from those hunters. Representative Becker Finn. Um, I'm good. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Carstensen. That was really helpful. Welcome. And I want to make sure uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen has the opportunity, if he has any questions uh, as co-chair, uh, the ability to raise a blue hand has not been there for him. So, I'm, uh, You know what? It's been very informative. I'm good so far, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Carstensen, uh, I know we've discussed uh, I've heard concern from landowners about uh, the collars on the deer with the deer study and uh, rubbing on the necks of the, of the deer. Could you maybe address the changes or what's happened with the, the deer movement study? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, we have began the project um, capturing animals in 2017. And in that first year, we had two different types of collars that we used. One was a, a collar made for adult males because we were trying to capture some of the movement dynamics of adult animals, adult males on the landscape for how much they move during the rut. And so we had chosen a collar um, that had an expandable uh, and contractible um, um, magnetic component to the collar that allowed for the rut, basically swelling from the rut. And then we also had an expandable juvenile collars. Well, what we discovered that next hunting season is that some of those adult males that had that expandable collar had neck irritation when um, they were harvested by hunters and had some signs of, of uh, irritation in the neck. 
And uh, so we were made aware of that issue and discontinued using those collars uh, ever since. Um, they were collars used in other studies on um, male elk and mule deer without issue. So unfortunately, we did see some signs of abrasions um, in necks from that cohort. So again, we discontinued that collar type totally. And to even further safeguard the juvenile collars that we were still deploying, we added an additional remote release device to every collar that enabled us to remotely release it. If we had any indication or reports of any sort of neck irritations going forward, we could identify that animal and either with a flight over the animal or close enough from the ground, uh, send a signal to drop the collar. And we have not had any issues in collar um, fitting that I'm aware of in the last two years of deployment. Thank you. Um, a year ago at this hearing, we had quite a bit of discussion about the Adopt a Dumpster program. And so I just want to give uh, each of you the opportunity to is this going to be ready uh, and working when the deer season starts uh, with the archery season in a few weeks? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, this is Jamie Gangwer again. Uh, yes, like I, I said, we have um, six. The North Central contracts are almost fully in place. The due date for bids back for South Metro was yesterday, so we're working on those, getting those bids awarded today. Um, and then the Southeast had until the 3rd. Uh, they're just a massive quantity uh, of those. Um, bids that we sent out. Uh, so we're hoping to have those in place by the 5th or by next Monday. But yes, yeah, so the deadline to put them out is the 18th of September. So we're looking really good with um, 18 days left to get these contracts in place and dumpsters on the landscape. Mr. Banky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the disposal, that was the, the thing that we wanted to make sure we didn't have the same problem with last year. So we've been working proactively and making sure that there's disposal locations within those areas. Uh, and we're confident that we've got those uh, as the contracts get let, we'll have places for those uh, contracts to, to dispose of the uh, butcher remains and the carcasses. And finally, uh, Dr. Carstensen, uh, you know, with uh, deer movement, uh, how would you describe uh, your interaction with uh, Wisconsin uh, DNR or the Iowa DNR? Uh, are they doing similar work in terms of tracking or surveillance? Um, you know, I think that we, we have hunters that uh, go across the border and uh, just wondering uh, what, how your working relationship is with those states. Sure, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we communicate with our Midwest group through our MAFWA, Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, um, quite often. I'm on that committee, but I'm actually uh, in even more frequent conversation with my immediate neighbor states. So um, between Wisconsin, Iowa, and the Dakotas, uh, we speak often. Um, Wisconsin has a very interesting uh, collaring project going on as well. They have for a few years, uh, but they're focused on collaring in their highest uh, CWD areas. Dane and Sauk counties, Iowa counties, um, where they're actually uh, being able to, to do some live animal tests um, at capture and follow confirmed positives through their fate. It was super uh, interesting projects there. But we're sharing data among that, those studies about general deer movements, um, migration behaviors, and that kind of stuff. So there's a data sharing between us and Wisconsin and Michigan actually about all of our collared information to help build better disease model models regionally. Um, with Iowa, they are not conducting any research uh, currently with deer movements. They do have some genetics projects going on, um, but not really movements. Um, and they also have, I, I would say, less funding available to do some of that work to them. Um, but we do share surveillance data um, all, all the time and are in frequent talks for what's happening south of us. And uh, I thought of one more question in the uh, Dakota County region with uh, uh, there's a lot of bird feeders, maybe some recreational feeding of deer. Uh, how do you reach homeowners in terms of uh, uh, trying to prevent a site where there can be deer concentration? And before uh, Representative Fabian, I do see you, so I will call on you next. Dr. Carson. 
Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Yeah, so we, uh, we've had some specific news release information um, uh, focused on the expanded feeding ban in the last uh, couple months. I think that's going to be increased as well. Um, we have not done a survey flight in this area like we had with the Pine County and Douglas County farm situations. We flew those areas looking for deer uh, densities, but it also looked for feeding sites so we could um, have some places for our conservation officers to focus on educational moments about what's changed with our feeding ban. This discovery of this deer in the metro happens uh, late enough in the spring, snow was gone, and any avenue toward to learning anything about those behaviors in winter was, was gone. So now it's basically um, just direct outreach through our communication networks with press releases and such to get the word out um, that they are now in a, in a recreational feeding ban area. Representative Fabian. Thank, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure how much longer the meeting is going to go on if you have more testifiers, but we were talking a little bit about deer movement. And I'm sure that you're aware of <clears throat> the situation in Kitson County with uh, Steve Porter and his white-tailed deer that he has on his servant farm. And uh, the ban that DNR placed on um, moving deer uh, last January um, he got caught in a situation where he was not permitted to move his deer to the uh, to St. Paul for the uh, uh, the sportsman show that was there. Uh, when he showed up there, obviously he got ticketed, and there was some of us who felt like the DNR um, was overstepping their jurisdictional authority. Uh, that outside the fence, that should be excuse me. Um, Inside the fence, that should be the Board of Animal Health, but they came up with their rule and, and the 30-day and the ban. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Porter decided to challenge um, the citation and uh, a lawsuit entailed where the state of Minnesota was, you know, going after him. Uh, the Ramsey County uh, Court attorney uh, dismissed those charges uh, in the in quotes, the interests of justice. So I don't know, uh, you know, what's going to happen going forward, but the agencies need to make sure that they stay with inside uh, the jurisdictional authority that they have. And I don't know if you or anybody else has any comments on that, but uh, I'd be interested in hearing something from someone else. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, I'd like to address that really quickly. That was a situation where we needed to act really quickly. The Board of Animal Health met. They almost initiated a, a, a movement moratorium to allow us to get this trace work done that identified the deer in Douglas County and other places, but they weren't able to do it. So Commissioner Stroman uh, did what she felt the department needed to do pr to protect the wild deer herd at that point in time, to act swiftly, to immediately put in a movement ban for the Board of Animal Health to complete the work of this trace out of that Pine County herd, which as we saw led to another, a couple other areas with some, with some populated uh, or some farms that were tested positive. Without that ban, who knows where those deer from that Pine County facility could have gone and what the additional impacts would have been. While I understand Representative Fabian's concerns and totally agree with them, we did everything we needed to do to protect the wild deer herd. This is an example of hopefully something that can be clarified in the Board of Animal Health's current rulemaking package that Dr. Carsonson sits on and we will do what we can to try to include some authority for the board to deal with these types of situations at hand, but uh, we did not take this matter lightly. We, we looked at it very uh, judiciously, and we decided that our, our actions were in the best interest of protecting the wild deer herd. So um, it was for 30 days. We dealt with it. It allowed us time to, to, to determine and learn what needed to be done, and uh, it got us to where we are today. So while it wasn't an easy, easy decision to make, it was one that we felt uh, did provide a lot of protection to the wild deer population. And, and we were in constant communication with the Board of Animal Health as we were, we were having those discussions as well, so. Representative Fabian.
Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. Um, I, I do agree that we need to protect the wild herd. There's no doubt about that. Um, but in this case here, uh, the conversations that I had with DNR, uh, trying to help Mr. Porter find a, a solution that worked for him with some sort of a variance or whatever, um, was rejected by DNR. And if you're familiar with what he does, I mean, um, I don't know how many um, deer there are in downtown St. Paul, but you know, his, his uh, deer go from his pen into a trailer. Uh, they travel to St. Paul, they never come out of the trailer and, and they go back uh, to his farm. So, and, and, and I appreciate the comments of, of, of uh, Commissioner Meyer. I do assistant Commissioner Meyer. I've talked to him many times and he and I have a very good working relationship. I just think that in this case here, um, I appreciate the interests, um, but I also think that, you know, we have rules and we have statutes in place and um, we just need to be cognizant of that. And we need to make sure that we're not getting on a slippery slope just because we think that this is in the best interest. What, what does the law say that we can do? And I'm happy to work with people going forward to find better solutions to these things. There's no doubt about that. I've, I've encouraged, uh, the Board of Animal Health and, and DNR uh, to work together on these things back in 17 and 18 when I was doing what you're doing now, Mr. Chair. And I thought that we did make some progress then and I want to see that progress continue, but it can't, it can't come at the rights of, of individuals and so forth. So thank you for your indulgence. Commissioner Meyer. Just really quickly, Mr. Chairman and Representative Fabian, I understand and I appreciate those words. Um, you know, we were also sued by the deer hunters and they withdrew that suit um, after we had discussions about what was transpiring. So, well, Mr. Porter was was unfortunately caught up in the, the, the action. We had no authority to provide an, a variance for him just under our emergency rule. Actually, if we would have tried to do that by the time the, the action would have been done, it would have needed to do an expedited rule on that as well. His situation would have would have the shows would have been over. So we recognize that we worked within the court system and within what we feel are our statutory powers to, to protect the wild deer herd. And as I said, hopefully this is an issue that can be addressed uh, in this upcoming updated rule package with the Board of Animal Health. And we're gonna work to try to ensure that that's taken place. So okay. thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. I see Senator Johnson has his hand up. So Senator Johnson, and then we'll um, I'll provide for a follow-up with him and then we'll move to the Board of Animal Health. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. And, and just to your point there, uh, uh, Director Meyer, I do want to say that that, that emergency power uh, that you brought, uh, the jurisdiction that you brought up the emergency power under was also of, of question as well. So when you when you say you're you're enforcing that emergency power order, I believe there was a court case that the prosecutor didn't even didn't even take the time to bring this to court because right on the face of it, that that emergency power that the DNR took uh, was outside the scope of its abilities. So you know we this is something that Representative Fabian has been very strong about is making sure that our agencies are within their jurisdictional authority. And that's something that I am extremely concerned about here is are we just doing things as agencies, as government uh, bureaucracies outside of what we are allowed to do? And this is something that's, that's very scary and yet we are willing to work with you to make sure that, that we can protect wildlife because we've got to do that. And we understand the risks that are involved, but that doesn't give you carte blanche to do uh, you know, things outside of, of what the statutes are. So uh, I just want to make that quick statement. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, Senator Johnson, thank you. We did consult with the Attorney General's office. We had numerous conversations with our general counsel and the Attorney General's office on our authorities. After those conversations, we determined that we did have the authority to do this and move forward. As I said, um, the deer hunters did um, file a suit against us and then they later withdrew it. 
Um, so, you know, that was never determined by a court of law, but certainly within our purview of our authorities and discussions with attorney general's office, we determined, and they actually had to sign off on the rule to get it done. So we had determined that, that we did have the authority. Senator, I understand your concern that we may have gone outside, but we feel that we were within our authority. And again, it's just, uh, it's, it's the way you look at how do you protect the wild herd, right? So um, in this case, this disease is, is very concerning to us and we wanted to do everything we can possible. And I sincerely appreciate your commitment to working with us and the Board of Animal Health to clarify this issue, to protect not only the animals outside of the fence, but also the animals inside of the fence from this just disease that we're facing right now. So thank you. Senator Johnson, follow up. Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, thank you, uh, DNR and PCA. We're going to move to the Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dr. Thompson, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chair Hansen, you can hear me? Yes. Excellent. Can. Chair Hansen, uh, Chair Ingebrigtsen, committee members, my name is Beth Thompson. I'm the state veterinarian and executive director of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, and thank you for the opportunity to present to this committee. As a reminder to all folks on this call, uh, the board is a small state agency. We've got oversight of domestic animal health, so that includes cattle, hogs, poultry, horses, sheep, goats. We have a foreign animal disease in the United <sighs> States right now involving a rabbit, and of course, um, the topic of this uh, farm service. We are now closer to 30 employees versus our usual staff number of 40 employees at the Board of Animal Health. First of all, the board provided a written update of the Farm Survey Day program to the committee members. Uh, this document is dated September 2020. The state fiscal year referred to within the document is the fiscal year ending June of 2020. So a few high level comments on that document. There are currently 289 farm cervid herds in the state with just over 8,000 animals. At the end of fiscal year, state fiscal year 20, there were 2,173 not detected tests for CWD. And then lastly, after detection of CWD in a Douglas County herd that's been mentioned and a subsequent trace back to a Pine County herd, there were a total of six animals that tested positive out of, um, out of all of the 11 animals in both herds, those two herds in Pine County and Douglas County. There is additional information on those two herds on page two of that document. Uh, the USDA, that's the United States Department of Agriculture Epidemiological Report is being finished, uh, should be out fairly soon. And just as a reminder to everybody, USDA is involved in these cases via paying indemnity for depopulated herds with CWD and in certain cases for cervids that are exposed to other positive animals and other herds. So moving on then to rulemaking, in 2019, there were changes made to the laws on farm survey day. Based on those changes, the Board of Animal Health started the rulemaking process earlier this calendar year. Much of what I'm going to mention right now can be found on our website, and that's www.ba.state.mn.us. So that's Board of Animal Health, bah.state.mn.us. So um, for me, uh, I usually just go to the search function when I get to a page, and you can search for surveyed rules. But you can also, there's a banner at the top of our page called Rules and Regulations. That'll give you a drop-down menu. And then you can choose public rulemaking from that drop down menu. Uh, there are links on our page to documents as they become available. Uh, first of all, important to note that the request for comments uh, was opened up two months ago, or a little over two months ago now, on June 29th. Uh, we are required to keep that comment period open for 60 days. And we are actually keeping our comment period open until October 30th, so about twice as long as we are required to do. So far, we've got, I think yesterday I noticed three people have commented uh, via that request for comments page. 
We also have other documents, links to other documents, such as the draft rule amendments and draft survey surveillance standards up on our website. And in addition to that, a couple of other things to mention to this group, we have stood up a rule advisory committee. Uh, this committee has met once and will continue to meet to discuss and weigh in on the changes to our survey day rules. Uh, at our first meeting, we were very fortunate to have Beth Sheffer from the Department of Transportation open up that first meeting. Now, Ms. Sheffer is an attorney. She's worked in the AG's office and in other state agencies specifically on rulemaking. So in that first advisory committee meeting, Ms. Sheffer talked about the advisory group as being a more formal an organized way for the Board of Animal Health to receive public input and expertise, and that the members of the committee were thoughtfully picked, even though an advisory committee is not required. So the advisory committee, to the extent that they can, can keep other members of their constituency up to date with what's going on and keep their comments and suggestions in mind when they're meeting. And uh, you can find the membership of that advisory committee on our webpage. Minutes from the advisory committee meetings will be published as soon as they are available. And we're encouraging everybody, if you have the time, to listen in on those advisory committee meetings. The meetings are scheduled for two hours, and the last 15 minutes of the meetings will be opened up for public comment. The advisory committee is separate from the listening sessions that the board has opened up for the public. Again, if they're listed on our website. We have currently four listening sessions that are listed. It has both an MS Teams link and then also call-in information. These sessions are called listening sessions because we want to listen to the comments and proposals from the public. Uh, we had one listening session last week. There were nine members of the public on the line, and our next session is scheduled for tomorrow. In addition to those listening sessions, we are also working on other opportunities for folks to be able to weigh in our, on our proposed rules. The board continues to expand notification of the rulemaking process. Uh, additional notice went out to the persons on our rulemaking list, uh, over 13,000, close to 14,000 recipients. Um, with regard to Minnesota tribes and tribal groups through the Interagency Rules Committee and other state agencies, we have gathered names and have tentatively set a listening session for that group the second week in September. We have Amish communities located in southeast Minnesota. Uh, the board has limited interaction with those communities via our uh, commercial dog and cat breeder program. So we are reaching out to others to see how we can uh, get information out to that Amish or those Amish communities down in the southeast. And then lastly, our press release on August 20th on the rules process went out to all media outlets, TV, radio, print in all markets with an active network in Minnesota. So with that, um, both chairs, I, I would appreciate hearing any and all additional possibilities on getting the word out on our rulemaking process, if there are specific groups, uh, anybody that you can think of that may, my, might want a, a listening session with us, um, please contact me or please contact our office. And with that, Chair Hanson, I'll turn it back over for any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, how was the advisory committee picked? Because it, it seems like there's, seems to me that there's a, it does, it's not very balanced. So I'm just curious about that. And then I'll have one follow up after that, Mr. Chair. Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Eklund. Um, for those who aren't aware of who's on the advisory committee, there's 15 members, and I will list them off very quickly here. There's representatives from the DNR, Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, USDA, uh, the deer farmers, the elk breeders, the deer hunters, cervid veterinarian. Uh, there's a cervid species non-native producer, there is a at-large cervid producer. Uh, there's a tribal member, a uh, member of the public generally, an at-large livestock producer. And then the counties also have a seat at the table. And to your question, Representative Eklund, 
Um, this was brainstorming amongst those of us staff at the Board of Animal Health. We also reached out to other state agencies who have gone through the rulemaking process and took input um, from different ideas that we got from a whole variety of different people. So there wasn't one single person that made the decision on how we could build this, but instead we reached out to as many people as possible. The um, interagency rule group was instrumental in guiding us and um, it, it's not good to get too many people at the table because we want everybody to come in uh, after they talk to their specific groups or, or those with their interests. And we want to make sure that it's a, a manageable group. So uh, we didn't want to go too far over 15 members. Thank you. Representative Eklund, a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this will go back to the, my comment earlier about when, when Dr. Larson gave his presentation. I, I just find it troubling, Dr. Thompson, that, that when we have research going on at our, at our state university, University of Minnesota, and they haven't even been contacted as part of the rulemaking process to find out, at least get their feedback. I, I find that very troubling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Thompson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Eklund. So one of the representatives on the, the committee is from the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Um, and in addition to that, uh, and I think Dr. Larson started to talk a little bit about this, uh, we currently are working with Dr. Scott Wells from the College of Veterinary Medicine uh, using RT Quick and, and using the folks in Dr. Larson's um, group. Um, Dr. Wells' proposal that hopefully will be funded is it, it grew out of a board funded project that has, has gone on for a couple of years now looking at biosecurity on cervid farms. So, with additional funding available from USDA, the board will be the administrative agency working with Dr. Wells and again, utilizing the RT Quick. Um, also, if funded, this project is also is going to include a couple other states. So it's a fairly large project. The Board of Animal Health is going to be the administrator of that project. And, and just as a side note too, generally the board doesn't directly fund validation of tests. So we were able to fund this biosecurity project, which will bolster the work that's being done by Dr. Larson's lab. So uh, hopefully that answers your concerns, Dr. Eklund. Thank you. Representative Eklund, follow-up? I'm good, Mr. Chair, thank you. Representative Wagenius. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the testifier, um, the last time that uh, you visited with us, um, you told us that current rules say that when a farm has been shut down um, after uh, we found a, an infected deer or elk, uh, it's fenced off for five years. Yet science tells us that prions last more than five years. So my question is, will you revisit this part of your rule um, that is not based on current science? Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Waginius. We will certainly revisit that if it is in our rule. I'm, I'm struggling right now to think if that is in our rule or in our statute. Uh, as, as you know, the the rule has to fall within the authority of the statute. So if we are able to, based on science, uh, make a change to the rule within our authority from the statute, we will do that. And we hope we have the right people at the table to move those discussions forward. Thank you. Representative Wagenius. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, for a follow-up. There are statutes, there are rules, but there's also the constitutional right to hunt and fish. And the Constitution should be your guideline. I mean, we are protect, protecting uh, the right to hunt. Um, so this is a rule that absolutely must be based on science, uh, not based on what interest groups, what stakeholders kind of agree on. It needs to be based on science. Dr. Thompson. 
Um, nothing further. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you. And again, uh, your contact information will be available. And uh, uh, as with some of the other scientific uh, uh, information that was presented, we will be posting it after the meeting on the on the committee website. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll go to uh, Sidrap, uh, Corey. Andy. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Chair Hansen, Chair Ingebrigtsen, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Corey Anderson. I'm a research assistant with uh, CIDRAP, or the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy uh, at the University of Minnesota. I'm trying to share my screen here. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, and I'm actually standing in for uh, Dr. Oserholm today, who uh, apologizes that he couldn't make it. He's actually chairing a WHO committee call for COVID, which uh, everyone is very familiar with at this point. Um, and so this will be relatively short. I'll just update you on um, some of our activities uh, related to CWD. Um, so first and foremost, I just wanted to point out um, our CWD Resource Center. This actually launched in August of 2019. Um, if you're not familiar with CIDRAP um, and what CIDRAP really does, it, it's, it really curates uh, science-based information on uh, a number of infectious disease topics. So uh, for example, we do have a resource center on COVID-19. We have resources related to antimicrobial stewardship. And of course, uh, Dr. Ostrom saw CWD as kind of an emerging issue. Um, and so we went ahead and, and compiled information and launched this uh, a year ago. Um, the interesting part about our, our efforts is that they are guided by uh, some of the leading experts in the field of CWD. So if you can see, um, we have 57 expert advisors. Um, here's some more information on them. And so they represent people um, in fields related to public health, medicine, science, wildlife, and agriculture. Um, six countries are represented. Uh, we have a number of professional degrees, and then we actually uh, did manage to have experts on BSE or bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, um, and Sir Roy Anderson and John Collins, both uh, located in the UK. Um, and so they're really guiding our content, they're vetting our content to make sure that science-based, comprehensive, um, et cetera, and we see that is extremely important um, when, when visitors want to be sure that they're getting the best information possible. Um, obviously, it's, it's difficult to hold meetings with 57 people, so we really tried to narrow this group down um, so we could have more focused meetings on a regular uh, basis. So in January, we formed an executive committee uh, made up of 14 members. We have representatives from CDC, different uh, research institutions, wildlife managers, et cetera. Um, and what we're trying to do there is we're basically having quarterly uh, Zoom meetings where we really talk in depth uh, for an hour about what activities they see as pressing, uh, what we can help out with. Um, and it's really helped. And so I'll just kind of cover uh, different areas that we've talked about in these meetings and efforts that we're, we're basically working on right now or we're going to be working on in the near future. Um, so first and foremost, uh, our first meeting was actually uh, right in the beginning of, of COVID. Um, and one of our executive committee members who works at a, a university, um, they actually kicked off a webinar series with COVID-19 um, and thought this would be kind of an effective uh, effort um, that we could get involved with, with CWD. And so um, we're actually undertaking that effort right now. Um, it's, it's a live webinar event, so people can uh, register and attend that live. Uh, it's a 45-minute presentation directly from the experts and leaders. And then there's a 15 minute Q&A at the end where people can ask questions. Um, if you can't make the live event, they are archived um, and available on our YouTube channel. Um, and we've had two so far, um, one with Debbie McKenzie on CWD pre on strains, um, and another just recently with uh, Vic Adamowicz um, on human dimensions of CWD. And we found that very helpful. A lot of people have attended, a lot of people have viewed, uh, it's very interactive. Um, with that, we're actually announcing our next uh, webinar. So just kind of plugging that here. It's with Nick Pinizzotto, uh, who is on our executive committee on our expert advisory group. Um, he's currently the president and CEO of the National Deer Alliance and uh, Quality Deer Management Association, which uh, actually just recently merged into one group. And so he'll be giving a presentation on September 24th, uh, just detailing what hunters should know about CWD as hunting seasons kick off. So if you're interested, I put the website down there. Otherwise, if you don't have time to write it down, I'm trying to go quick so I can finish here. Um, feel free to follow up with me and I can get you that information. Um, another activity that, activity that we found uh, would be helpful based on our executive committee discussions would be CWD white papers. And um, what these would really be is basically we would form uh, working groups 
uh, depending on topics that are identified as high priority. Um, and we would write basically a comprehensive science-based report on what we know and don't know about these topics. Um, that could be used as a valuable resource for wildlife agencies, for uh, policymakers, uh, for research institutions, et cetera. Um, and so kind of the two uh, main priority topics that we identified in that first executive committee meeting uh, was one very familiar to a lot of you in this meeting today. Uh, first, it's the safety of using certified landfills to dispose of CWD infected carcasses. Um, and people were also people also thought it would be helpful to uh, basically lay out what we know and don't know about CWD tests. And those are the existing uh, validated tests uh, such as IHC and ELISA. Um, and so with the carcass disposal issue, we actually formed a management working group uh, back in February. Unfortunately, uh, with COVID, things kind of got pushed back further than we wanted it to. Um, but it's made up of, of experts in landfill engineering, prion biology, human health, wildlife management. Again, we have some of the leading experts in this area when it comes to the research. Um, we have representation from CDC. Um, we really think it would be formed as a living document so it could be changed as the science evolves, um, but it would really be useful to you know, landfill operators, uh, policymakers, agency members, et cetera. And so that will be uh, coming out uh, hopefully soon. Um, and then last, just highlighting uh, another activity that we're regularly involved with. Uh, we do publish monthly CWD newsletters. Uh, we actually first started that in November of 2019. Um, if you haven't seen them, they just feature the latest activities that we're involved with uh, to keep people up to date. Um, we also summarize and provide links to noteworthy news stories from across uh, basically the world. We do feature uh, Norway and occasion, but mostly in North America. And then we list uh, recent peer-reviewed publications. Uh, if people want that, um, they can sign up for free. It's sent directly to their email. And again, that's uh, at the beginning of every month or at the end of every month, sorry. Um, with that, just in conclusion, um, obviously we know that CWD remains a critical wildlife management challenge. Um, again, I wanna emphasize that with our group, we're really trying to combine the experts and get the expert consensus um, and put out the best information that we can I know, like with a lot of things, uh, getting science-based, reputable information is very important uh, to make the best decisions possible. And I think it's very obvious with uh, the presentation from Dr. Larson and his group that um, through our collaboration with them, the University of Minnesota, just in a short time within the past year or two, has established itself as a, a leader in CWD research and policy. And we're very excited to see where this uh, takes us. So with that, I will turn it over to any questions. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. Thank you. Members, any questions? Mr. Anderson, while people are thinking, I'll ask, uh, have uh, the same question Representative Eklund had asked. Uh, Dr. Larson, has the Board of Animal Health uh, reached out to SIDRAP to uh, uh, incorporate any of the science uh, or the national or international science that uh, team that you have assembled? Um, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, they have not reached out that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not sure, I can't speak for Mike. I know his inbox is crazy, so he might've missed it, but not that I'm aware of. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick question relative to how um, CDC is looking at the research that we've just heard about from the University of Minnesota. Would like some comments if uh, he might be able to offer them. Mr. Anderson. I'm Mr. Chair, Representative. Um, CDC has been uh, proactively working with a group actually at Case Western University. Um, so it's the National Center for Prion Disease Pathology and Surveillance. Uh, it's a mouthful. Um, but they are doing uh, quite a few things related to CWD. So um, in Wisconsin, um, for example, there actually uh, is a list of people who have had an animal test positive. Um, they were informed by the state health department um, and the health department follows up with them and basically asks what their intentions are. Um, and a number of people have said that they're going to consume the animal even uh, in the presence of a positive test. So CDC is maintaining that list. It's an active disease surveillance list. Um, there's follow-up with every um, suspicious prion disease, uh, human case of human prion disease, uh, where they do autopsies at Case Western Reserve. 
Um, and if it is suspicious, they do uh, follow up interviews, uh, et cetera. And so they are taking an active role um, in making sure that that uh, cases of human prion disease don't have any direct correlation with CWD. Um, and if they if they did, uh, they would ideally pick that up. And so that human sur surveillance piece is uh, very important. Representative Heitzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I might have not been clear in my question. What I was referring to and asking specifically was, has CDC been looking at this new test that's been developed by the University of Minnesota? And uh, what are uh, opinions, if any, that have been formed in its uh, development and its validity? Or, or uh, Dr. Larson. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, sorry for misinterpreting your question. So I know that RT Quick, uh, as Peter, uh, Dr. Larson has described, um, is a relatively new test, and that group at Case Western Reserve um, does use it on samples of uh, cerebrospinal fluid, for example. Um, so it is a test that's being used um, to potentially diagnose uh, human prion diseases. I have not heard a formal statement by CDC as to whether it's in regular use, et cetera, and I'm not sure um, Dr. Larson can speak to whether they've reached out to him or um, he can speak further on that. Thank you. I can just follow up real quick, um, Chair Hanson, members of the committee. Uh, the test RT Quick, um, it's probably around three or four years old now. Uh, available to the research community, looking at at um, prion misfolding, RT Quick. This test is being used. Uh, for research in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and all the prion diseases. So Kretzfeldt-Jakob disease, BSC, Scrapie, and CWD. So that, that the, the test itself, RT Quick, has been around for a few years in the research realm. And only now, after more labs, including our own, have adopted it, is it getting enough uh, momentum to be formally validated by USDA? And I imagine at some point, CDC will be involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a formal validation. So that's where we are, is that it's, it's, it's thus far been useful for research purposes and just now is getting into the validation for other, for official diagnostics. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So either testifier could respond. Uh, I'm very interested in knowing what it's going to take to determine whether the RT quick process is accurate and reliable and usable in real world circumstances. Are we years away from that? I, you know, what's the time frame and what does that process look like before we know if it's all that we hope it is? Mr. Anderson or Dr. Larson? I, I'm happy to talk to speak to this. Um, members of the committee, um, the, the, the body of literature so there are studies being uh, conducted now on CWD on using RT Quick in C for CWD surveillance. There are studies that are published where they have compared the method to ELISA and IHC, the other the tests that the DNR and the Board of Mental Health are currently using. Those studies have shown routinely that RT Quick is more sensitive, it's more accurate, it's able to pick up uh, infections earlier. Okay, so it's a very robust test. Um, and, and our own, our own work inside of the MinPro labs is, is agreeing with that for the, with those published studies. Now for the USDA, we are working with the USDA, um, to validate, to formally validate the test. And that process is going on, will go on over the next year. And so I, I would say that once the USDA formally validates it, you will see in the next year, hopefully, you will see broad acceptance implementation around the United States. And this is why it's so important that University of Minnesota, the MinPro Lab has this up and running now so that we can be prepared for that widespread implementation and hopefully help the board and the DNR for surveillance. Mr. Anderson, did you have a comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, that was a great explanation, Dr. Larson. Uh, Representative Heinzman, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think they've answered the question as best as they can. So thank you for the opportunity for follow-up. No. And uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, and I apologize that he had had uh, texted me earlier uh, um, uh, for a question for Board of Animal Health, but he does have a question for Mr. Anderson. Senator Ingebrigtsen. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, just a, just an informational thing. Uh, uh, maybe the maybe the DNR could also tell me what kind of a population we're looking at this year, uh, or a guesstimate for deer, and what the take hopefully will be, as well as the Board of Animal Health. Uh, uh, how many do you, we have? Two hundred and eighty-nine uh, survey farms now. How many did we have uh, five years ago? Can you give us that comparison? And then I have a question for Mr. Anderson. Dr. Tom. Dr. Thompson. Sorry, I was double muted there. Mr. Chair, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Um, Senator Ingebretson, I would have to pull up that information. I would say that five years ago, we were close to that 400 mark, but I will look that up and provide it to the committee members. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Meyer, if you can, do we have a number on the deer count in Minnesota? Uh, is, it, is it, obviously it's pretty strong. Um, and what kind of harvest are we, are we talking about? Commissioner Mr. Meyer. Chairman, I referred to Michelle, Dr. Carsonson on that. I mean, she probably has the most up-to-date numbers. Dr. Carstensen. Mr. Chair and members, I believe um, our population uh, modeling across the state has indicated strong uh, herd uh, numbers. And I just recently was listening to uh, Dr. Barb Keller, who runs our deer program, talk about that. Um, so I think our targets uh, for this year as far as harvest have been similar. So we have that 200,000 200, deer um, kind of goal. Um, and I believe that that is consistent with this fall for what uh, we're expecting uh, could be the potential harvest and approximately a million, de a million deer across the state. Thank you. And uh, the question to, thank you, Mr. Chair, a uh, question for Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Um, a very interesting study of, uh, as consumption of the CWD uh, infected uh, food. And you, you say you have people that actually are doing that. Is that on a constant basis or is it somebody that said they had a, a an infected deer and they're gonna go ahead and eat it and now you're gonna monitor it. Can you give me a little more, a little more of, as to how that's working? I'm very interested in that. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Chair, um, yeah, so that is an ongoing study. I believe the list last I checked had over 1,400 uh, participants or people that did uh, say they are willing to fo do follow-up with CDC. And so uh, I'm not sure as far as the details go if they're doing, you know, semi-annual follow-up, but I know that if, if a person on that list were to contract a prion disease um, or die of a human prion disease, I'm sure that would kind of uh, open up some investigation by CDC. Again, I'm not sure the details as far as uh, what that follow-up consists of, but yes, there is a list of people from Wisconsin specifically uh, of a fairly high number of people who are uh, knowingly consuming positive animals. And that's, and that's uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, that's every year then they're knowingly consuming positive animals. I mean, how, how does that work? Mr. Anderson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, so I know it would be, they would harvest a deer, um, they would get it tested, it would come back positive, it would be followed up with, and basically uh, DNR or the health department would ask what their intentions with the animal uh, were. They would say that they were going to consume it, um, whether that you know be over the course of the next year or so, um, I'm sure that kind of depends, but it's basically in follow-up to a positive uh, detection of a case in a deer um, and the person that harvested that deer um, is willingly consuming it. So I'm not sure what the time span would be. And I'm sure if they shot another positive animal and that tested positive, um, I don't think they'd redundantly list them, but I, I'm sure they'd note that. Again, I'm not familiar with you know, the, the details of that. I've just, I've talked to someone at CDC who is in charge of that though. Yeah. I'd be, I, think, uh, I think I would be very interested, maybe the committee as well as to when that started and what the results have been. Uh, and I suppose that's ongoing. Maybe that can happen. Maybe the prion thing can happen five, six years after consumption. Uh, I don't know that, but it's very, very interesting science. And I, um, I'm uh, always interested in people that are willing to do that. Uh, not that I'm saying that I am, but uh, why they would do that. And, and uh, 
Uh, yeah, it's an interesting concept, but it's something that's very valuable, it seems to me. Thank you. Chair Hansen, if I could just add real quick. Dr. Larson. It's estimated at least 15,000 CWB positive deer are consumed in the U.S. annually. And I've heard of estimates uh, as high as 20,000 CWB uh, carcasses consumed in the U.S. annually. And it's due to a, you know, a lack of the diagnostic tools that we have. But the CDC is, Corey is correct, and it's, it's, it's a nationwide surveillance system that they've implemented where they want to understand who's eating, uh, who has been exposed. And then you're absolutely right, Senator Ingebrigtsen, that process could take six years, 10 years, you know, and so they get on a list for, for monitoring that. That's correct. And, and a follow-up then, Mr. Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, a follow-up then, uh, uh, Dr. Larson, uh, of those 15 to 20,000 people uh, uh, or families, whatever, that have consumed that, have you, have you found anybody yet to have uh, died from these prions consumption? Dr. Larson. Uh, Chair Hanson, members of the committee, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Um, to my knowledge, there is no documented case where uh, uh, someone who has consumed CWB positive meat has contracted a prion disease. Now that said, the CDC, were, they're worried about this because no two prions are exactly the same. And as CWD spreads to new herds, new populations, those CWD prions can be change their shape in different ways. And they're worried because there may be a, a strain of CWD that does match to human and can start the disease. All right. Thank you. Members, we're nearing the end. I want to note uh, that we do have written testimony from the Bluffland Whitetails Association. And this morning we received testimony from uh, the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. Uh, both of those will be uh, posted. The Blufflands is posted already. That had come in on time. Uh, and uh, some of the science that was referenced today and some of the projects, uh, for example, the deer study from DNR a movement, we can post on the website as well. Um, we are nearing the end. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, do you want to have any closing comments? I don't. I just appreciate the uh, the discussion. I think every time we have this discussion about uh, about what is a very important issue to uh, not only our our consumers of venison but the hunters, uh, you know, in Minnesota, and it's a huge, huge industry. The more we learn every time we get together. So I really appreciate the work that the science community is doing and the research community is doing, and and uh, as well as the DNR and the Board of Animal Health staying on top of things. Thank you very much. And members uh, for the general public, we have also posted, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and I have talked, it's a little bit off topic, but there is a draft bill for a technical correction relating to an LCCMR appropriation that uh, there was an error in. We do not know if there will be uh, a special session uh, in September, but if there is, uh, I would encourage folks to look at that. Uh, it's with an appropriation where there was an error in the ending date. And so that has been posted so people can look at that potential. And I don't know, Bill, if you want to address that as well. No, I think you addressed it well. I, uh, I, I guess we don't know yet whether there's gonna be a special session and it has to take at least that to get it done. So um, we're, from, we're from the state and we're, we're here to help. <laughs> Unfortunately, it takes, a, it takes an opening session to, to take care of such a small little tweak like that, but that's the way it is, so. Thank you and thank you members. Um, you know, it is challenging uh, uh, with COVID-19, uh, uh, we're not able to meet in person. Uh, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and I wanted to make sure that we were following up on the intent to have uh, information we've invested uh, into the science at the University of Minnesota. And as we've heard, uh, they're doing great work. I would encourage uh, the agencies and the university to work together to incorporate that science into the decision-making. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that uh, the Adopt the Dumpster, uh, uh, the kinks that were there last year appear to be worked out. We, we have uh, 450,000 deer hunters in the state of Minnesota, and I actually think I predict that number will go up this fall. Uh, we have seen that the number of people who have been angling uh, during the summer uh, with uh, the fishing license numbers have gone up and I predict uh, that we're gonna see hunting licenses go up 
that is one reaction to uh, COVID-19, people are engaging in more outdoor activities. And so trying to reach new hunters, trying to reach uh, unique hunters with information is very important. Uh, as our eye is on the ball at the Capitol with COVID-19, we cannot ignore uh, that CWD is continuing to spread. Uh, and so uh, thank you for the University of Minnesota's work on that. Um, thank you for the agencies that are doing it. And I would encourage Minnesotans to engage in the rulemaking process and contact their legislators or these agencies or the university if you want more information. Uh, this is a serious problem that continues to vex not only Minnesota, but other states and around the country. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.